Hello class. Today we are going to look at the communist revolution in China. So this is going to be requiring a little bit of backtracking. We're going to jump back to 1911 um, and look at what's been going on in China and how communism comes to um, the fore in China. So um, we're going to look at the collapse of imperial China, the Chinese Civil War, and then the rise of communist China, which will set us up for the rule of Mao Zedong and communist China. Um, so, as a brief recap, um, China, before 1911, right, um, by most objective measures, it's the world's greatest superpower, right, until um, Great Britain shows up and turns China into a puppet state. How was Britain, a small island nation, able to defeat China? because of the Industrial Revolution and um, its more advanced military technology, right? Um, this is where we studied about the Opium War, etc. Um, China refuses to modernize its economy. It doesn't successfully industrialize. Um, and other countries start to take advantage of China's weakness here, including Japan. Um, you'll remember Japan um, uh, industrialized itself and wound up um, taking uh, Korea, for example. How do the Chinese people react? Well, citizens protest. There's a series of protests and attempted rebellion movements, um, which are all unsuccessful until 1911, right? Why is the revolution of 1911 successful? Because the Europeans allow it, right? Um, and essentially they decide, hey, the whole purpose of, of having the Chinese emperor in power from the European perspective, is so that um, the Chinese emperor can pull the strings of his people and just be the puppet of the Europeans and get his people to do what the Europeans want them to do, um, producing certain goods, buying certain goods. Um, and since he seems unable to keep um, order at this point, I mean, at this point, the emperor is two years old, um, Emperor Puyi, but um, he's not really uh, doing his job anymore, or in this case, his regent isn't able to control the country anymore. Um, so we are going to let this rebellion succeed and we will run out, um, run him out and we'll help prop up a new, um, a new government, which we can also try and make into a puppet. Uh, this ends the Qing dynasty, um, and establishes the Republic of China. So the end of 2000 years of imperial rule, right? Um, so at this point, Emperor Pu Yi is toppled. He's about six years old, um, but he's not killed. He's basically run into exile. Um, and eventually the Japanese will actually put him in charge of the puppet state of Manchukuo when they invade uh, Manchuria to try and have some veneer of, you know, Chinese rulership, um, even though, again, it's going to be a Japanese controlled area. Okay, um, after 1911, there's a constitution written. Um, we've got a new Republican, which means representative government. The leader of the Nationalist Party, the people who want to, you know, make China um, the way they think it should be, a leader in the world, um, not, not a puppet for other countries, that is Sun Yat-sen, um, and he becomes elected president. But within a month, he actually turns over power voluntarily to a military general named Yuan Shikai. He does this because in order for a country, a, a new country to, you know, get off its feet, its new government, it's got to have the backing of the military. Um, and so the way to get the military on board here is to um, kind of aggressively incorporate them into their, um, into the government by putting a military general in charge of it. Right? So from 1912 to 1928, the world's going to recognize this as the legitimate government of China. And we'll talk about what happens in 1928. Um, you'll notice the flag up here at the top. Oops, sorry there. Um, is a flag, the new flag of China under this republic. It's supposed to represent uh, five races under one flag. So there's five bars, the red one's kind of hard to see there. Um, and again, the idea being that um, each major ethnicity in China, and again, there are a lot of ethnicities in China, but the five major ones want to see themselves represented um, as having a say in this new government. So they use um, all the colors in the flag. Um, Okay, so there's actually going to be a lot of racial backlash against this, um, despite the fact, in particular between the Manchu and the Han, 
um, even though the leaders are going to try and promote the idea that the Manchu and the Han are really one Chinese people, but you know they're different ethnic groups, and so there's actually still going to be a lot of tension there. Okay, um, so the aftermath of 1911, right? The um, rebels, the, the nationalist rebels, they had wanted an end to foreign control, democracy, and economic security for all Chinese people. Did they get this? Uh, I mean, you know, they they got a new government and constitution, but most of China is actually ruled by provincial military governors, so essentially warlords. Um, so this idea of like an actual democracy and popular participation, not not a whole lot really changes for the average Chinese citizen. Um, these governors are not really taking care of the Chinese people. Hold on. Sorry about that noise. Um, all right, so basically, you know, this new government under Yuan Shikai, anybody he doesn't really like who's in a position of power disappears. Okay, um, anybody he doesn't like winds up, you know, assassinated. Um, basically, the revolution gets kind of taken over by old style military bureaucrats, and these are not agents of tra change. So they do get rid of feudalism, but they don't really fundamentally restructure society. They don't do a lot to really help take care of the lower echelons um, of society and the peasants. Um, so not a, not a whole lot gets better or changes for the, um, the average Chinese citizen. Um, do the Europeans leave? Uh, not, no, because they are... Um, they helped support this, so particularly the purpose being to keep their hands in China. So they maintain their strongholds, they keep extraterritoriality, um, they, don't, they don't leave, right? Okay, so um, you can sort of, if we had time, compare this to the French and the Russian revolutions, um, but we're just gonna, we're just gonna keep on moving here. Um, so here you have kind of the, the different warlords ruling China at this point. You don't need to um, commit these to memory, but again, just a visual um, representation of what's going on here. Um, then, of course, we have, um, we have World War I, which is going to break out in 1914. And um, China is going to lend its support to the Allies with the hope that by supporting the Allies, um, if the Allies win, they will get um, more respect from Great Britain, France, the United States, and be treated better, more like an equal, and be able to recuperate some of the territory that had been taken from them. The, um, the outcome is that the Allies do win, as you know, but um, they give the territory from the losing side, so like German-held Chinese territory, they give that to Japan. How um, are the Chinese people going to feel about that? Yeah, they're pretty angry. Um, and this launches what's called the May 4th Movement. Okay, so um, the these allies give some of their territory, or not their territory, but the, the territory from Germany um, to Japan because they're trying to keep good relations with Japan. Remember, Japan at this point is an industrialized country. It's more westernized. It's getting more respect from these western countries, including, again, um, they no longer, they've given up their claim to extraterritoriality with Japan. So, and China's the big country that they're trying to kind of keep down um, because if China really does get its act together with all those people and all those resources, it could be a real um, challenge for European countries and, and the United States. Okay, so anyway, China um, feels, you know, insulted, disrespected um, by this, and they there's something called the May 4th Movement, which the future communist leader of China, Mao Zedong, will look at as the sort of starting point, the turning point for um, the Chinese communist movement to really get underway, um, because it's pretty much like, hey, look, the nationalists had their chance. They set up this new republic. Um, they said they were going to bring honor back to China and, and prestige and respect. Um, and it didn't work because look at how these allies have uh, treated us. So clearly we need a different way. Um, and so Mao Zedong is going to become a leader of the Communist Party in China. Um, and this is uh, where he's going to look as kind of at the starting point where people start breaking ranks with the nationalists and looking for something else. Um, 
So if you want, you can pause the video and read this uh, for yourself, but we're going to keep moving. Um, so the significance of the May 4th movement radicalizes Chinese intellectual thought. Liberal democracy is no longer the goal. Again, it looks like that hasn't worked. I mean, really, it hasn't really been a democracy because it's being ruled by regional warlords for the most part. Um, more people start to support the ideas of Marxism and Leninism. And remember, Leninism is an adaptation, but a distinctly different approach than Marx's approach. So keep that in mind when we look at what China is actually going to do with communism. Um, and if, if they're looking to Marx and Lenin, that should already give you a heads up as to what kinds of changes they're going to make to the Marxist philosophy when they apply it in China. Um, and of course, as I said, we see Mao Zedong helping to found the Communist Party of China. Um, all right, so Sun Yat-sen, again, our nationalist leader, creates a temporary alliance with the communists where he agrees to work with the communists who are becoming very popular among students and peasants. And to the next, together, the nationalists and the communists battle the local warlords, trying to reunite the country into one government, one people, which was the promise that this is what this was supposed to be from the start, right? Um, communists, when they liberated areas from warlords, they would redistribute the land to the peasants. And so the communists are becoming more popular. The nationalists are capitalists. They're um, more interested in like big business interests and, and not redistribution of wealth or land. So they're not helping the peasants as much. I mean, getting rid of a warlord, that's good, but it's not necessarily as um, a loyalty winning as redistributing this land. So um, eventually the warlords are defeated. China is brought under one government. So their mutual enemy has been defeated. Um, and now we have this nationalist communist alliance that was in place to defeat these warlords. Well, is that alliance going to last? Right? Think about what nationalists and communists believe in. What things could they agree on? What types of things are going to bring them into conflict? I mean, these are two separate groups for a reason. Right? Communism is a Western philosophy, right? Whereas nationalism, um, the nationalists are trying to value and elevate things of Chinese origin, um, traditional Chinese values. So there's going to be a conflict there as to just the philosophies they're using and the place they see for each of those. Um, communism advocates the destruction of old ways and old ways of doing things and past culture and tradition and religion. Whereas, again, the nationalists don't stand for any of that. They have the opposite view. Um, a lot of high-ranking nationalists are wealthy businessmen. So the communists are going to have a problem with that, right? They're the bourgeoisie, and the communists don't like that. And then, of course, the nationalists are going to prioritize Confucian ideas, which the communists dislike. That's, you know, I mean, Confucianism, not only is it an old philosophy, but it is also a philosophy that prioritizes and values tradition and traditional ways of doing things, which is exactly what the communists don't want. So... Probably unsurprisingly, this uh, temporary alliance turns into a civil war. Um, so here we go. Now, um, Sun Yat-sen dies, and his successor is a man called Chiang Kai-shek. He becomes the head of the nationalists, and Chiang Kai-shek sees the communists as a major threat. Now, the civil war hasn't broken out yet. This is what's leading to the civil war. Um, he sees them as a major threat because, well, they're becoming really popular with the peasants, and there are way more peasants in China than businessmen so and, and, and city dwellers, right? So in April of in 1927, Remember I said, I said, um, you know, something's going to happen in around 1928. So in April of 1927, the nationalists massacre leading communist officials and union members. The communist party, they don't, they, they are outnumbered. And after this massacre, it, they're almost entirely destroyed. You know, the communists might be more popular and have more regular followers, but in terms of like actual party officials and like an actual infrastructure of like people who could kind of carry the banner, um, they're, they're outnumbered by the nationalists, especially after this massacre. So, um, 
the Civil War then officially breaks out in 1928. Okay. Um, the communists are enraged by this massacre. The, the ones that are left launch a civil war against the nationalist government. Okay. I, is this going to be an even battle? No, we just said that the communists are outnumbered. Um, Mao will actively, he's one of the communist officials that managed to survive this massacre. He's going to actively recruit peasants to join his Red Army. Um, so they're going to be fighting basically a guerrilla style war because they don't have the numbers of troops or well trained troops to actually try and take on the nationalists in sort of all out battle. Um, they're going to operate in the foothills and mountainous regions where it's hard for the nationalists to get to them as Mao continues to build his base. And so this is going to lead to what's called the Long March, um, where communists make their way from the south of China to the north covering 6,000 miles on foot. Um, this is the equivalent of walking from New York to San Francisco and back and then some. So it's a really long march. Um, it's dangerous. It's difficult. They're undersupplied. Um, they're sleeping, you know, sometimes in swamps, uh, back to back, kind of sitting up to try and make sure that neither one of them uh, you know, these buddies, like, fall over and drowns in their sleep. Um, ultimately, they hole up um, in caves up in the north, again, where it's going to be difficult for the nationalists to root them out. Um, but this is, I mean, they're going through snowy terrain. Um, they're going through um, areas where there's not a lot of readily available food. But as they go, they're going to be trying to recruit peasants, and people are going to be joining up, right? Um, but thousands die from the cold, from hunger, from exposure to the elements. They're basically just managing to keep one step ahead of the nationalist forces. All right, so um, if you are not in China, if you're looking at what's going on in China from the outside, right, you've got a civil war going on. So what might that, what kind of opportunity might that present for other countries? In particular, which other country might be looking to take advantage of this situation of having China fighting itself? Think about the timing here. We're looking into, at this point, the 1930s. You've got Japan looking to make its move, right? It's taking Korea. It's going to invade Manchuria in 1931. And then, of course, as this civil war continues to uh, wage, um, it is going to make a leap from Manchuria and into the rest of China, right? Because China's forces are divided against itself, okay? Um, and so it sees a lot of early victories, um, and it's treating the Chinese that it conquers absolutely horribly, which we, um, we will cover in lessons when we start talking about uh, World War II, if we haven't already. So um, for these nationalist reasons, we talked about how Japan's um, attitudes towards the people it conquers is, um, you know, very similar to other fascist or nationalist um, countries, and they see them as inferior and so, and just kind of in the way and like infestations in land that it wants to use for its own people. So they're going to be treating them really, really brutally. So what would the next logical step for the nationalists and the communists in China be when you have Japan invading China? They're going to call a timeout on the Civil War, um, and they're going to team up to fight Japan because the communists and nationalists in China might hate each other, but they hate Japan more, right? This is a situation of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, and so the communists and nationalists will team up similarly to what they did against the warlords, right? Um, who's going to help China fight Japan? Basically, the people that see Japan as a threat. So as Japan continues to expand its empire and ter take territory um, that belongs, that had been claimed by the colonial empires, um, they're going to be interested in helping China beat Japan now. Before, again, they wanted to keep China in check and they were supporting Japan. Now Japan has started encroaching on their territory in French Indochina, um, et cetera. And so um, they will now start supporting China. The United States will also take China's side. They will be trading to both China and Japan, but when push comes to shove and they need to pick between the two, they're going to pick China because China has more resources, it's less of a rival, and it has more customers to sell things to, right? So we're going to give 
the Chinese government, which right now is run by whom? It's still technically the nationalists, right? They've been fighting the communists, but the kind of communists have been the underdogs. They, they've been the ones trying to topple the nationalists. So the, the nationalists are going to be the one getting this aid money and um, guns and whatnot. And, um, well, the leader of the nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek, if you're him, what do you do with the money? Do you use it all to fight Japan and help the communists and yourself together fight Japan? Or do you hold some back? It's going to hold some back. Um, first of all, there are actually a lot of issues with corruption amongst the nationalists, um, which, you know, the communists, of course, aren't going to say, well, of course, they're corrupt capitalists and the bourgeoisie. But um, Chiang Kai-shek, additionally to having issues with corruption, um, is going to say, well, you know, what's going to happen once uh, this, this war is over with Japan? you're going to see the civil war start up again, right? Just like we saw with the warlords. So we know that we nationalists are going to need um, arms and, and supplies then. So we should probably hold back some of this and, um, and wait and use it against the communists when that war inevitably starts up again. Um, the thing is that the nationalists holding back some of their manpower, some of their, um, some of their resources is going to give an opening um, to, to the communists, um, in terms of, well, it's going to shift the burden to them, right? And so they're going to be doing actually a lot more of the frontline battle, battling and fighting and, and dying, right? And so when Japan is forced to surrender Manchuria and it has to go back home, it loses the war, right? Spoiler alert, World War II, Japan loses. Um, the communists have been doing a lot of the actual fighting on the front lines, which in one sense could have weakened them because they've been expending resources, but they are the ones who the Chinese people have been seeing as the heroes of World War II instead of the nationalists. Right? Um, the nationalists, they've been fighting the Japanese too, but, but less than the communists. And so again, the peasants already mo a lot had more support amongst the, or with the, the communists already had more support with the peasants than the nationalists did, but now it's it's been turned up several notches, okay? Um, and so popular support has really swung decisively in the favor of the communists, and that's going to really help them out um, fighting the nationalists. Um, again, the corruption of the nationalists has given them a bad rap. So by um, once, the, once the war, the civil war kicks off again, which it does pretty quickly, um, basically within a year of the end of World War II, um, the communists managed to win. It still takes about five years, um, but by 1950, China is officially under Mao Zedong's communist rule, um, and he's going to rename the country the People's Republic of China. Okay, so um, People's Republic of China is still technically, to this day, the official name for mainland China, what you think of when you think of China. Um, the easy way to remember this is to remember that anytime you see the word like peoples in a country's name, it's usually an indicator that it's a communist state. Um, the same thing with North Korea's official name, which it's not communist yet at this point, but it will be, is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. They really tried to hit you over the head with how much for the people it is. Um, and this makes sense because, again, Marxist philosophy was all about local democracies and people having autonomy and control over their lives and what they produced. But, of course, it's kind of ironic because in the way we see communism play out in these countries, um, that's obviously not what we see, right? They become either totalitarian or authoritarian, um, and they don't give people really a say over their lives or control over their own lives. So either way, um, you hopefully that can help you remember which... Um, what the official names of these countries um, actually are. So here we have the People's Republic of China. Um, meanwhile, the nationalist government, right, so they've lost this war, they flee to Taiwan, down here, okay? And Taiwan's official name, to this day, is the Republic of China. Um, just like South Korea, um, its official name is the Republic of Korea, right? So. Actually, in both these cases, when it comes to the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and the Republic of Korea, 
you'll notice that like, first of all, North and South is not in the names of, you know, the Koreas. Um, and both China ex uh, is in the name of both the People's Republic of China and Taiwan's official name, the Republic of China. And that's because in both cases, um, both parts of the country, China and Taiwan or North and South Korea, they both claim to be the true government of all of the territory. So South Korea claims to be the true government of all of Korea, and so does North Korea. Um, China, People's Republic of China, claims to be the true government of not only mainland China, but also Taiwan. And Taiwan claims the reverse, that it is the Republic of China, Taiwan, is in charge not only of the island, but also of all of mainland China, and that it it is in charge of all of that, that it's supposed to be one united country. Um, and so really, like when when the People's Republic of China makes a law, technically that law is supposed to apply to the people who live in Taiwan, but they're not going to listen to it. And the people who live in Taiwan, when the Republic of China in Taiwan makes a law, um, technically the people in the Republic of China, um, the people in the People's Republic of China are, you know, they're supposed to follow that law, but of course they're not going to, right? So it's this kind of odd situation where both for, you know, 50 plus years now have, well, actually like 70 years now, have been claiming to be the true government of a one united China. Um, this gets really tense uh, because what does this do for other countries, for example? So you can see here in this cartoon, right, the military general. Um, and he's talking to this woman at a cartoon party and he's pointing to his like various medals and decorations. And he's saying, this one is for walking the fine line, defending China and not, or sorry, defending Taiwan and not offending China. And so this is meant to illustrate what a tough spot this puts other countries in, um, particularly in this case, the United States, because, you know, the United States, who should they side with? Should they side with mainland China? Or should they side with Taiwan? Well, you know, ideologically, Taiwan shares more in common with what America claims to have to, to its values to be. Free speech and actual democracy where you can vote for the people that represent you and make the laws. Um, they're a capitalist uh, economic system. However, a lot of you are aware of the fact that um, basically since the 1980s, well, 70s and then and forward, um, China and the United States, mainland China and the United States have become more economically intertwined. And so to the point where today China holds like massive amounts of American debt, but they basically buy up our debt and essentially kind of loan us money. It's complicated, but um, and we also have lots of manufacturing that comes from China, right? A lot of our businesses outsource. They they open factories in China because it's cheaper to have Chinese workers make stuff and then they ship that stuff back to the United States. So, And we also sell stuff to China, so we rely on their customer base. So if China and Taiwan were to go to war, if one of those countries was actually like, okay, this is it, we're done playing this game, we're going to you know, invade and, and take over and really unite the two countries... You know, which side would the United States take? What do you think? I mean, I can't give you a clear answer. Um, there's each president um, has always has pretty much been pretty unclear on this. And, and usually uncertainty is a bad thing. Um, it makes it hard to make decisions. But um, in this case, actually, it might be a good thing. The fact that neither the American people, nor China, nor Taiwan, know which side America would take. And America currently still has the most well-funded, um, technologically advanced army on the planet. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty important variable is which side would America take might be keeping them both in check. Because, you know, if you were China, mainland China, and you knew that the United States would take your side if you invaded Taiwan, well, what would that do to your calculation? It would make you more likely to invade Taiwan because you don't have anything to fear, really. I mean, you could take Taiwan as it is, but if if America were to take Taiwan's side, well, that's a whole different ballgame. But if you knew America were going to take China's side, then, or, you know, your side, um, then there's nothing stopping you. So you'd probably invade Taiwan. But the fact that they might take Taiwan's side you don't want a war, all-out war with America. That's like way more expensive and deadly and dangerous. 
So you probably should just kind of chill out. Um, same thing from Taiwan's perspective. If you knew that um, that the United States was going to take your side, well, you know, that's a really big help because you're just this little island, right? So if you knew America was going to take your side, it might make you more likely to pick a fight. This should hopefully remind you of what we saw with um, World War I and how the countries interacted where since Austria knew Germany was going to back it up, it was willing to pick a fight, not only with Serbia, but Russia. Since Russia knew France was going to back it up, it was willing to take on Austria and Germany at the same time, right? So knowing that you've got an ally that's, you know, a big, a big power player can make you more reckless. Um, and so in this case, the uncertainty, um, a president not outright saying they favor China or Taiwan can actually be a good thing for world peace. Um, whereas usually um, uncertainty is not great um, for countries, e economies or, you know, militaries. Okay, um, so that gives you a sense of the current policy between China and Taiwan and the United States. We will talk a little bit more about North and South Korea um, when we get to the Cold War. Um, okay.